Well, good evening, everyone. It's uh, 6.30. We'll start the meeting. Um, start by uh, advising everyone that we are not expecting a fire alarm this evening. So if there is something that sounds like a fire alarm, we must assume it is a fire alarm and, and gently leave the building without falling over each other through the sign fire exits. And if you are signed into the building, please don't go away. But we meet outside the edge of the Memorial Park on this cold night just to make sure that everyone who was in is out. But it hasn't happened so far. One of these days it will, so please remember not to run away when um, you've left the building. Um, to advise everyone that the meeting is being webcast, and that means that uh, when members or officers speak and press their button, they will appear on the webcast, and if you come forward to speak to the members, what you say will be on the webcast and recorded for posterity. Um, um, uh, any apologies for absence? Resignations or replacements? Nothing heard. Just absent. Any declarations of interest? There are no urgent items or announcements. Uh, uh, is it your will that uh, we sign the minutes of the 2nd of October meeting as a correct record of the proceedings. I'm going to hand that to Donald to sign because he chaired that meeting. Um, are there are no referrals from any other committees or from the council or from the cabinet and therefore we move on to the business of the evening which is the planning applications and um, if the uh, I think we have um, Mr. Ward to speak on the Evergreen application. If you'd like to come forward, Mr. Ward, please, and sit in one of those chairs at the end there. I'll, I'll find that's fine. Um, I'll just explain the procedure, but we'll get the officers to present the, introduce the report before we go on. Thank you, Chair. This is a retrospective application for the conversion of an agricultural building into a farm worker's dwelling and the removal of a mobile home and returning the land to agricultural use. Um, if I can just bring to your attention the update paper with the viewing panel report together with um, various changes to conditions 1, 5 and an additional condition number 6. This is following the receipt of an additional plan. Um, the officer's recommendation is for approval for a three-year temporary consent. Thank you. Uh, Mr Ward, if you wish to, you can speak to the committee or you can sit there and say nothing and I'll ask them if they have any questions. Um, sorry, if, if, could you, I'm sorry, I should have asked you, when you speak, if you just press the big white black button, on there and because it goes on the webcast. I just prefer it to be a permanent position, permission rather than temporary. That's all. Sorry. Members have any questions, Mr. Ward? Thank you, sir. If you'd just like to retire back to the other seats. Um, uh, I'm asked by Councillor Sanders, who is the Ward Councillor, to apologise for his absence. He, he uh, is not here and not speaking, well, they actually happens to be in the building, because he is a near neighbour of the site and therefore has considered himself to be potentially having a conflict of interest um, and therefore will not uh, speak as ward member. So we don't have a ward member comment. Are there any questions of the officers? Thank you, Chair. Um, just a brief question. The condition for um, three-year temporary um, can, can the officers just clarify where that condition has arisen? Is it from the Red, is it the Reading um, Agricultural Consultants, or is it partly a policy that we have? Thank you. All right, it's basically both. We have a policy whereby you wouldn't normally allow new dwellings in the countryside unless there's an agricultural justification. In this instance here, we're saying that there's only justification for one dwelling on site. And therefore, we're recommending that the existing agricultural barn that's being converted is the one that should be retained as the agricultural worker's dwelling, and that therefore the mobile home needs to be removed. Otherwise, you'd end up potentially with two on the site. Sorry. 
permission. The temporary nature of the permission is basically it's from Reg and Agricultural Consultants. The business at the moment doesn't justify a permanent dwelling on the site because he still needs to build up the business. And, it, and with as with any new agricultural enterprise, you would normally allow, if it's justified, a temporary three-year permission to allow them to build up the agricultural enterprise. At the end of that period, they can either then reapply from the further temporary period if they haven't quite established the enterprise, or if it is well established and has been in profit for a year, then they could apply for a permanent dwelling. Maybe to clarify what I think might have been under the question, uh, it's the conclusion of Reading consultants that the case isn't entirely proven and it's policy that where there isn't an existing agricultural business, temporary permission is given until the agricultural business has shown that it can sustain itself. So the, the, the recommendation is to give permission for three years at the end of that three years, it will be looked at to say, is, is it a sustainable business that requires somebody to live on the site, in which case it would become permanent. Councillor Miller. Thank you, Chair. Uh, as a sort of follow-on from that one, I got the impression that when we visited the site, that this business has been, in fact, uh, operating for some time. Uh, and that's why I'm trying to get my head around this business about the two buildings. Um, if permission was granted for the retrospective converted agricultural building and yes the uh, condition that the the temporary mobile home has to be demolished that ends up with one that's it's fairly simple but uh, all the words I'm hearing is that this business has just been established and I don't believe that's the case could you bring some clarification to this please I think it's a recent business. I can't say exactly when he started doing it. I know Mr Ward has had other enterprises in the past and this is different to them. I don't have a specific date as to when this one was started. But it, in terms of the actual business plan, it's in terms of Reading Agricultural Consultant's view, it's at the early start of the establishing an enterprise. But I don't have an exact date. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, perhaps I should have asked the, the applicant, but what I wasn't too aware of was how many of the buildings that are there um, are actually going to be used for this enterprise. I mean, I, I, I went and saw some, some you know, Dale, they weren't Dales, so they're a little bit older than Dales, but um, chicks in, in one of the buildings, but I wasn't sure how much of I mean, quite a number of buildings there, and it hasn't been spelled out. I know it probably hasn't got anything to do with the use of of the um, the retrospective, put it that way, change of use. But as you can see, there are a number there. Whether he intends to use all of those, I, I wasn't aware. I mean, they're, they're all buildings that are for agricultural use, apart from the one that he's retrospectively converted, so they have agricultural use for them. Um, I can't say whether he'd be using all of them. I should think if once the business plan, if he ever got up to the number of birds that he's proposing, potentially it could be in all of the buildings. Thank you, Chair. Could I just check one thing? I'm sorry. Um, in regard to the temporary use of three years, it, that's a recommendation from the Reading Consultants, is it no more than that? I mean, is that a variable? Could that be a different period to the three years? Could it be longer in terms of proving the viability of the business? As a rule, the previous advice that was attached to PPS 7, which has now been um, overridden by the NPPF, but we still use as material to look at these, the recommendation was always that it would be three years because that would allow a business to establish itself. At the end of three years, it can be reassessed again. If they haven't proven that, that it's financially viable, then you could allow a further, possibly just one year permission. Or it may be that it's then financially viable, and then that's when you allow permanent consent. But normally, the, the standard is a three year one, and it was usually, that was in the advice that we had that was attached to PPS 7. Any other questions? Open it up to discussion or propositions.
Councillor Tomlin. Well, <clears throat> part of uh, the questioning was that the applicant on the site visit had mentioned that um, if you have temporary planning uh, permission, it makes life very difficult to get uh, presumably bank loans to actually help you develop business. So you're in a sort of spiral. Now, whether, you know, that is something we wanted to discuss and that was really the reasoning behind the three year. I mean, it, it's it's um, planning permission, it's uh, agricultural, and so if it failed as a business, we wouldn't actually see it turn into domestic dwellings because it would have to be another planning application. So it would be a agricultural site with permission. I, I, I'm sort of wondering, you know, if there's any weight we can put on the fact that th this might restrict growing the business and, and cause a problem to the applicant. My understanding is that the it's nothing to do with the planning process as to why the applicant wants particular planning permission for personal or business reasons. Um, the assumption is that an applicant goes for agricultural permission when there is an agricultural need. Um, at the moment, the clear view of the consultants and supported by the officers is there is not at this stage a proven agricultural need. And while one is sympathetic to the applicant's uh, desire to establish a formal, because that might, in, might improve the chances of a business loan against perhaps the security of the dwelling, uh, which hasn't got any security at the moment, I don't, it's not really a planning matter, and I don't think it's a basis for uh, giving a particular slant to the planning permission, because if you think about it, anyone can have a field and put a house on it and say, I'm going to produce an agricultural business in the future, but nothing might ever happen. Um, so th th there has to be some constraint on dwellings in the countryside, and this is one of them, for good or ill. Thank you. Councillor Tucker. I'll propose the recommendation with the changes of the conditions. Um, what were the changes of the conditions? Oh, in the up. Is that seconded? Thank you. Are those in favour of that? Thank you. Um, one question, if I may, uh, having had that decision, um, it occurred to me reading the conditions. What happens if the condition requiring the demolition and removal of the um, mobile home, if it is a mobile home, is not fulfilled at the end of three months? Because that's been, as I understand it, that is not an authorised thing in the first place. It hasn't been for a very long time. Essentially, because the condition requires removal within three months, if that three months expires and the mobile home has not been removed, then enforcement action could be instigated to, to ensure its removal thereafter. So um, as soon as that three months has expired, um, visits will be made to the site and we will pursue that if, if it's not been removed within that time period. It may take a different view, but I, the reason I ask is that we, we have a lot of enforcement uh, cases which dribble on for a long time. And, uh, one particular one in my ward that's been going on for far too long. And this, this is a long-standing enforcement issue from N years ago. Uh, and, I mean, is there something that the committee can say or do that says that we would like to see this condition enforced swiftly and assertively, or some similar words, as opposed to letting it take its normal course all over again and not being fulfilled? Question to address you. I wasn't sure. Um, yeah, I mean, essentially, that that can be captured in the in the minutes of the meeting um, to ensure that view from the committee is, is is known. If that is the view of the committee, um, that essentially the approval of the application is reliant upon that condition, and that in in, in sort of natural course of events, that condition would be robustly and, as you say, certainly um, pursued if it's if it's not complied with. So that can certainly be captured in the in the minutes um, of the meeting. Right, let me just test then. Am I out on a limb here, or do the members generally take the same view? Yeah, agreed. Thank you. Right. So um, uh, the application is approved. Co officers confirm? 
So the application be approved subject to the changes on the update paper to the conditions plus the additional notes on the minutes with regards to the enforcement action with regards to condition three. Thank you. We'll move on to number two and I think we have uh, representatives of the applicant here, if you'd like to come forward, or a representative, and just sit there for a second, and we'll get the officers to present the report and recommendations. Thank you, Chair. This is an application for a two-storey rear extension to the existing property for a function room at ground floor level and counselling and resource rooms at first floor level. If I can draw your attention to the update paper with the viewing panel report. Together with a further update, we've received comments from consultees on the amended plans. No further objections have been raised. Um, and just clarifying an issue I, I believe that was raised on site with regards to con condition six and how the rooms can be occupied and the officer's recommendation is to retain um, condition six and the recommendation is for approval. Thank you. Um, you have four minutes to speak to the committee. Thank you. And, and I'm sorry, I didn't introduce you. It's Jane, is it? It is. It's Jane Gates. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I just really wanted to, to really um, dwell on the, the point that you've just made regarding um, Condition 6. Since the Bluebells uh, was opened from inception, the plan and the delivery has always been to provide respite holiday breaks in addition to single day visits to the families of seriously ill children. And by that we define them, um, they are children that have either a life limiting or life threatening condition. In the last 18 months, we have provided 174 respite breaks. 446 individuals have also come to the Bluebells to enjoy single day visits. 109 family members have had music therapy at the house. Um, 545 seriously ill children and siblings have attended activity days at the house. Um, and in addition, we've had um, a huge number of well-being therapy sessions. My concern is that the impression that I've got is that you would be restricting the use of the new rooms to literally just those who are staying at the Bluebells. But the Bluebells is so much more than just available to families that stay. It is a crucial facility for so many families, many of whom live in Basingstoke and Dean, um, because it is a place where they can come for use of the leisure facilities, loose use of crucial facilities such as the hydrotherapy pool, use of um, the existing wellbeing room, uh, access to music therapy and access to activity days. Now my concern would be how I would police using the additional rooms on days when we have, for example, activity days. Because if, if I'm, if I'm uh, getting the right inference from, from this condition, those visiting for activity days would not be able to use the, 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 the sitting room. We prefer to call it a garden room, it's not really a function room as such. So my concern is that, um, that families would not be able to use that room. My other concern is that um, on very infrequent occasions, we do host events such as a Remembrance Day. That's a once a year occasion, and it happened um, earlier this month, and I think we had 50 people in total, and that includes all of the members of staff who were there. Is the suggestion then that that room would not be able to be used by those, because by definition, those people are not actually occupying the building in terms of staying there, they're occupying the building because they're there, but they're not actually staying there. I, I'm going to just uh, do, do something which isn't normal here, just to tease this out. If you'd stay there for a moment before members are invited to ask you questions, just to ask the officers um, to clarify what we understand to be the present planning status of this site. Um, because if all of that activity has been going on, uh, it may or may not be technically lawful. Um, but if it isn't, then it could be a certificate of lawfulness or it could be a change of use application. Uh, and there doesn't seem to be anything in the report that says what is the present accepted use of the premises. Bear with us for a minute. I mean, looking, looking at the permission that was granted previously, it is for the the dwellings, but it also refers to respite facilities. Um, there was no um, restriction on the original permission that tied those facilities to the occupants only. 
Um, so I would say the activities that are going on at the moment um, basically would be ancillary to the mission that's on site. That would be our view. So again, just to clarify the position, if that's the case, then it seems to me superficially that um, that's not the right word, but you know what I mean. Um, that if that is the case, then the condition is actually imposing a condition which doesn't exist um, on part of the premises, albeit part of the premises which don't currently exist. But it is it's effectively as a condition on the site, uh, on part of the site, which is a new condition of use. I think you're right. The, the condition six, by referring to occupants, it's implying that it's people who are only residing there who are using the, the three units that are there. Bearing in mind that what we found out tonight in terms of the amount of other activities that go on at the site, you'd be imposing something on a, a small part of the building, whereas the rest of the building could be used in a totally different way, which we would still consider would be ancillary to that use. It may be better, um, uh, the condition could be better worded so that you could control the use of those rooms, that they're ancillary to just the bluebells acknowledging the fact that they do other things there as well and it's not just the occupants but also possibly putting on that it's not rented or sublet to any other um, outside um, groups and that you know that they and it's used independently to the running of the bluebells it could be the main concern here is the amount of traffic that it's going to start to generate so if it's all tied in with the bluebells and the respite home and the ancillary um, activities that go on in connection with that a condition worded along those lines might be better. What I'm going to suggest is that somebody, I might ask you myself, if you don't want to actually say anything more to us, uh, would ask you if it's your intention that, um, uh, that the current rooms will be used in exactly the same way as the rest of the site is currently used, and you're not going for a big increase in trade, if I can use that appalling word. I can say categorically we would not be use, uh, allowing the bluebells to be used by any external uh, parties. It's, it's, it's a very private place and it's a place that is exclusively for seriously ill children with no intention of changing that. Members have any other questions? Thank you if you'd just like to withdraw. Uh, questions to the officers? Somebody like to move something then? Or discuss it in some way? Councillor Miller? I'll move the recommendation provided that uh, condition six is reworded along the lines that Sue just mentioned. Is that agreed? Thank you, members. Officers, please confirm. Thank you, Chair, that the application be approved subject to the conditions on the agenda paper with an amended condition six that basically would say the extension hereby approved shall be used in association with and ancillary to the function of the bluebells and shall not be rented out, sublet or used independently from it unless otherwise agreed in writing by the local planning authority. Thank you members. We move on to item three um, which is uh, uh, One Cops Road, Overton. Um, I have Councillor Tilbury who will speak to us as the ward member. I don't have uh, the applicant or any objectors. Uh, would you like to come forward now, Ian, please? And I'll ask officers to present the report. Thank you, Chair. This application proposes the erection of a single storey side extension following demolition of the existing, erection of a detached garage and repositioning of the oil tank. Members viewed the site last Friday. The committee update paper states that the comments of the highway officer have been received and they raise no objection to the application. However, officers are recommending the application for refusal. Uh, the proposed garage, by virtue of its siting, is considered to be unduly prominent and detrimental to the character and appearance of the street scene and the wider character of the area. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ian, you've got four minutes. Thank you, Horace. Um, yes, uh, thank you. Yeah, sorry I missed you at the site viewing on Friday. I had a prearranged appointment and the, uh, the applicant can't be here this week because this week, they're on holiday this week. But unfortunately, the plan application had to come to this committee, apparently. Um, is they've sent me through a, a bit that they would love, like to have said, so if I read that, it should only take about two minutes. But uh, they apologies for not being there in person. They'd already booked a family holiday. Uh, they lived in the property for six years, and the applicant has, pro for the pros, were to extend the sides of our house, reposition the garage to the front, and to move the oil tank. 
We would like to make the extension to our property in order to provide a lar larger kitchen and utility room. We do, however, still require a garage to store our cars, bicycles and other equipment, which is why we have submitted both extension and garage within the same application. Having the garage at the front also affords us the opportunity to recite the oil tank, which is currently in an awkward place, as the oil del delivery has to come through the house each time to t the tank needs fill in, which must be fun. In drawing up the plans, the architect has done everything possible in order to minimise the impact of the garage from the street view and then from our neighbours' view, as such none of our neighbours have raised any objections. Please take into consideration that our property is on a corner plot and the proposed garage is sited away from our next door neighbour. Furthermore, our property is on a slope and so the front garden is set at a level significantly lower than the road. Taking all these factors together, I believe the impact on the street view to be minimal. The garage roof is of a hip design and will be permanently screened by soft landscape and is shown on our street scene and will therefore have little impact. In review, with respect to the screening, we can remove the existing hedge and replant the replacement or allow the existing hedge, which is already some five to six foot high, to grow. In fact, last year the hedge attained a height of some nine feet before we cut it back. I am more than happy for this to be made a condition of the application being approved. I would also like to point out that the, the properties in Cops Road are not of a uniform layout. In fact, at the other end of Cops Road, the property also on a corner plot recently had planning approved for a double garage that is located further forward than the house. Close to our property on the corner between Cops Road and Beach Close, there is also a property with a prominent double garage on the corner of the plot. In summary, I would like to say that the impact of the garage to the front of the property is minimal, that it is not detrimental to the street view, that the application has received no objections from our neighbours, and the layout of the properties in Cops Road are neither consistent nor uniform. I mean, that's obviously that's the applicant's view on that, so they too can take that as as read, basically. Uh, I mean, my thought, I'm, I'm not really much more to add to that. I think I'd agree with the points he's made there. I think the issue is is precedent. The, the officers are concerned that if you load a garage on this corner plot or in front of the property there someone did it three doors up well I don't think anyone would particularly like that and the neighbours would certainly probably object well I assume they would but it, I think the thing is with corner plots or the end plots in any road there is always a difference there but, but we talk about the issue of precedent well we're always told we have to judge every application on its own merits so you know precedent shouldn't really come into it and this is always a bit of an odd one we were always on the planning committee we were, we were always even that you know we can't have a precedent there but but there are precedents if you look round over and actually uh, resident pointed out himself there there is one estate or, or the one new, new development now relatively new of six houses where they put the garage blocks at the front so they actually like it's like one minute here. so so there are precedents for this and the one on the other side of the road where again the garage was built in front of the house but but i mean i think that's other than that, I think everything's been said there. One other, oh, enforceability of the hedge. I mean, it's suggested we can't enforce the, the hedge. It's, it wouldn't be uh, right to do that. But obviously we have landscaping on a lot of applications where we say, well, the landscaping has to be in place. So it can be a condition. And I'm sure this has come up before, certainly I'll recall when I was on the committee there. But the only thing I would say is I think, you know, Residents do pay a lot of money for planning application. It does seem odd that they have to, they're then to given a date, which is particularly in the school holidays or whatever, and, you know, it can't be moved. It can't go to the next one. I think that's something we need to look at. At the end, they were here to provide a, they are our customers. You know, we are there to, to help them, not to make their lives more difficult. Although, well, obviously, being on holiday, you run out of time. Pay over that. Okay, thank you very much. Horace. Just stay there a minute. You press your black button again oh, in, yes. case, in case anybody wants to ask you a question. Members? David? Ian, sorry, just in terms of the preamble that you did on behalf of the applicants, did, did I hear you right, because obviously I observed it when we went on the site visit, the existing hedge, which is pretty substantial, could be thinned out but would nevertheless grow higher, I thought would be a pretty effective piece of landscaping. And, and did you say the applicant is willing to have that imposed as a condition and uh, retain the hedge? Was that what they said? The officer suggests you, it isn't enforceable. If it isn't enforceable, that means that no landscaping is enforceable on any site. Well, well that, to some extent, that's my experience. But, but we, we, we do put it as a condition on things. So it should, we do it with major sites. You know, if we, why can't we do it with a site like this? So you know, it's got to be screened or whatever. And I, I don't even need to be particularly higher because it is quite a low pitch. And they have kept the, the hip quite low there. And it is sort of, they're on, they're on the side of a hill and it's down a bit, as you'll have noticed on the site visit those of you there. Other questions? Thank you, Ian. Uh, questions to the officers? David? 
Thank you, Chairman. I, I just wanted clarification, if I may, really. This is on the um, update, obviously, following the site visit. But in terms of the, um, the highways officer's comments, which are contained in the update sheet, um, where it refers to, well, it says however, but I'm not sure how that applies, but a condition ensuring that the areas indicated for parking are retained is considered reasonable to impose and should be imposed in the event that the application is approved. I just wasn't entirely sure what those parking areas are. Um, forgive me, not seeing that on the plan as well as I should have done, but could that just be pointed out to me, please? Oh, sorry. For the assistance of the committee, um, the, uh, the reference I was trying to make was the use of the garage and the forecourt that remains after the building of the garage, if it's, if it's permitted. Is that effectively what's marked as three there? Just to be clear. Three and what the other garage. And, yeah. Any other questions? Uh, can we just clarify uh, what are or aren't reasonable as conditions with respect to landscaping and hedges? I've got a feeling you have difficulty having a condition that forces somebody to have a hedge of a particular height, but I wait to be enlightened. Yes, in terms of conditions to do with landscaping, obviously we usually do, or we are known to put landscaping conditions on, but they're usually subject to a five-year period, and after that time, obviously the applicants are free to then remove that landscaping and change it as they wish. In, in this instance, it seems that members would want to retain the hedge. Again, like I say, we would then be seeking, I assume, to retain it in perpetuity, when really, usually as part of a landscaping scheme, again, it's only usually for five years. Also, you'd have to give some thought to the fact in terms of the heights and things like that. So when you're looking at saying a hedge should be retained, you're not saying kind of how it should be retained, so what height it would be, what condition it would be retained in. They're very difficult things to enforce. Um, so you'd be looking at stipulating what height, what, you know, what condition it would be about it being replaced, if it died, that type of thing. So you'd have to give some thought about how we would enforce those matters. I interpret all that as being it's very complicated. Yes, Councillor. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, one question to the officer. Is it not possible to put a TPO on a hedge? Pretty um, I, I don't think so, is the honest answer. I, I don't know uh, categorically, but I, I think the, the issue around a TPO, in any case, you'd have to have a, a very strong reason from an immunity point of view as to why you'd want to protect it if it's simply to be acted as screening. I don't think that would, would sort of meet the test of requiring one in any case. Yeah, in, in, in conservation areas, they'd be protected to a certain size in any case. I, I suspect the uh, idea of uh, requiring uh, a resident to maintain a hedge to a particular minimum height might be regarded in law as onerous, I suspect. Um, and as officers have said, incredibly difficult to enforce because if it goes a foot lower, he trims it one year a foot lower, what do you do? No, tell him to let it grow another year. It is quite tricky, I think. Um, Chris, is, is this another question? Yep. Yeah, sorry. Well, it's a question related to this. If the hedge was conditioned or, or didn't have the condition but died, if he wanted to build, because it, it is actually the sort of um, fencing, if it, for want of a better word, to his property, if he wanted to build a wall, would he need planning permission? And, and being close to the highways, if he wanted a close boarded fence, would he need planning permission? Adjacent to a highway, you can go up to a metre high with a wall or a fence. Uh, there would be no restriction on landscaping, so soft landscaping, but yeah, only up to a metre. Over that, you would need planning permission. Uh, no other questions opening up to discussion or some proposition from somebody? Oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. I mean, commentary really very quickly. I, I mean, I. As usual, say I respect the views that have been expressed in this regard by the officers, but certainly my own observations on site were that the views expressed by the local members and Councillor Tilbury, Councillor Baker, saying that 
you know, within a street scene of differing house types and given the lack of symmetry, and when you look up the road, there is a lack of symmetry. That's a fact, I would have thought. Uh, they don't believe it would harm the character of the area. I know these are subjective views, etc., and they are on my part as well, but genuinely I didn't think that this would have that detrimental effect on the um, character of the area. And to that extent, I disagree with the officer's view on this, no more than that. And I think also, I mean, it's fascinating, I think, to... No, sorry, interesting to note the Parish Council has no objections about this application. And similarly, we quote the MPPF often time, and taking note, more note perhaps, than we did previously about local residents' view is important. And on that basis, I'd like to see this applica application be approved. Well, I, if I may, I'll move it now. Yep. I'd like to second it. Councillor Tucker. I just wanted to say I can understand why they want to do it, but my my view, if I lived in their home and had built what he wants to build there, I would find it very dominant to be looking straight out onto this high thing because the top is going to be the same height as the house itself. So that's my view. I just I I think that they will regress it. Yes, they will have something to hide house their cars and bikes or whatever. But um I think they will regret it. Yes, I, I was um, uh, mindful of what was said, I think probably by Ian, I may be wrong, about uh, planning consents with garages in front of houses, and we've got one in my immediate vicinity, which is a real eyesore. Um, but this is a row of houses by a developer which were cheerily, cheerfully given planning consent uh, with garages in front of them. It's been moved and seconded for approval. Uh, in favour of approval? Against? That's carried. Officers, please. Okay, so... I May I suggest, Chair, that uh, it's really the opposite, as Councillor Potter has mentioned, opposite to the reasons for the refusal. It does not impact the street scheme, the street scene, <laughs> and Dominic, no, correct. Okay, application has been uh, approved for, for that reason. In terms of um, conditions, obviously we have the standard plan number condition, time limit condition, materials to match the host dwelling, both in terms of the extension and the garage, the highways condition to ensure a sufficient um, parking and cycle space is retained. Environmental Health have also recommended a condition um, to ensure that the the area in which the existing oil tank is located is free from contamination when that's uh, removed. Um, and I understand it that members don't want any conditions to do with hedging or boundary treatment. Well, I got the impression that anything, that the sort of thing that members would like to see would be onerous to enforce. And probably, in my opinion, we would choose not to enforce. So it seems idle to put it in. Less officers have a different view. Was content with that. Uh, we move on to the, uh, the the next item, which is a telecoms report and a single application for a telephone mast, uh, which the site viewing flew past or drove past or went past on two wheels or some similar thing. Um, I propose, unless anybody wants to have a big debate about it, to move it from the chair. Seconded. Agreed. Agreed. Um, and then we have a, a report from the um, planning and development manager, uh, unless he wants anything else to happen, I'm very happy for the rest of the officers to leave at this point, because it's, a, it's not a, you know, not a matter for decision by the committee. I think legal might want to stay. Na 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 na. Invite Mike to uh, introduce the report. 
Uh, thank you, Chair. This is this is you, really, a really report regarding work that's been uh, undertaken uh, by Blazing Tick and Dean Borough Council in uh, consultation with others under the M3 LEP um, partnership. It is really to set out a development charter for the approach to be taken towards proposals for um, that have particular business um, implications. It really is not a material planning consideration to any decisions made on subsequent planning applications, but it's really to set out more detail as to the approach that would be taken in considering those, th those aspects. Um, it builds on the council plan priorities in terms of improving economic vitality in particular, but also builds on the requirement that the council is under, as with all other councils in any case, as set out in the MPPF, which is to deal with um, all applications positively and proactively. So it's essentially brought to members' attention to set out that's the approach that's being endorsed by the development charter, but as I say, it's not a material planning consideration to any decisions. Any questions on this or comments? Councillor Tucker and then Councillor Miller. Sorry, I, I don't think you can call it nitpicking, but I just want to understand how it, how it all works or would work. Um, the one thing that I put a tick beside was <coughs> When it says under the under the pledges, we will ensure that where any development proposal is cross-border or initiatives, etc., all relevant parties will have an opportunity to consider, etc. <coughs> that I think is very very important and, and is to be applauded. This is, as I understand it, is is only for businesses, is it? It's, I mean, as a priority over um, any other residences. It doesn't. It's certainly not intended to to prioritise business um, applications over over any others. It's simply to set out a consistent approach between the way authorities within the M3 LEP group deal with um, proposals that that have business implications. But it's certainly not intended to prioritise over any other types of applications that the borough may deal with. So, for example, um, householder. Um, applications have the opportunity to access the duty planning officer system, which is very different to the way you know, a, a, a large-scale application for business may be attached. It's to do with the approach, if you like, as opposed to any actual outcome of decision. Um, thank you. Um, with regard to um, 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 where are we? Pre-app type things. Um, in the middle, yes, yes, it, it doesn't, they're not numbered, unfortunately. Um, <clears throat> we have, have started, haven't we, um, a system whereby it, we can have members sort of, I can't, I can't say call in, but it's something like that. To, but yeah, sorry, technical term, sorry. <laughs> um, is that going to be, uh, I mean, it, that's not, not, admit, not, not mentioned here. So, has that been mentioned in all your discussions, or...? Uh, that hasn't specifically been mentioned as yet, because authorities will still have the ability to, to work within their own processes. This is really about the general overall approach. I think really that would be the next step, is that when, um, uh, when examples of good practice, and I would suggest a pre-application panel meeting would be examples of good practice once more, uh, more of them have come through to the panel, then that would be put forward, if you like, as something that could be considered under this under this type of approach. I've got another one, if I may. So, um, <clears throat> when it comes to um, pre-apps and when it comes actually to an application, will the same officer deal with it from pre-app to main application? Normally, yes. Uh, and that is the intention of, of, of most pre-applications, particularly where it's on, obviously, the larger and more com complex schemes, where the knowledge, if you like, of, of the site and the discussions that have happened at the pre-application stage can be advantageous in terms of resolving issues when it comes to the application. So that's already our approach in any case. Um, I'll stop now and come back, maybe. Thank you, Chair. Um, i pick up on a point that Mike just made. Uh, a charter, to me, is a very strategic document. It just all sets out the boundaries within which uh, this planning and development would be encompassed. However, in the purpose of the charter, right at the start, down to the next bold heading, there's no mention, as you did, of the 
uh, relationship to residents, as a bit, householders, if you will, the first line provides a statement for business applicants and stakeholders. There's no other mention in there, and that to me that the purpose of the Charter has to encompass all those it's meant to encompass. I'm carefully saying what it should encompass, but it's the, uh, if, the, if the tone of this is to encompass everybody, commercial, residents, and business, then it should say so right up front. Because the next real reference to uh, the, those three elements is the last line of the Charter. And it should be the first line of the Charter, may I suggest. Because uh, I, I think exactly what uh, Councillor Tucker just said, she mentioned the householder. But then that gives the scope right up front of what this Charter should encompass. And then hopefully, and uh, I would then be able to read this Charter and see that we're hitting all the points that en encompass those three elements. Uh, it, it's a comment and a suggestion. I might comment on, on the comment. Uh, this, this has come out of the um, Enterprise M3 consortium, um, and therefore it's a, it's an, it's a business-driven product, if you like. Uh, I think what, there are some clarifications needed, and I totally agree with that, and I, I've raised a question with the council leader um, to look at this and make sure that it does what it intends to do and doesn't inadvertently do things it's not intending to do, such as distinct differentiating between a person and a business in a way which is unfair to the person, which would cause a lot of aggro. So uh, it, it, it's my opinion it needs a bit more wordsmithing, um, and that will mean Mike and colleagues going back to the other partners in, in the consortium and saying we, we think that this needs to be amended in these ways. Uh, the other question that I asked uh, on, on your behalf is, um, although this is not a material planning thing, um, because it's not a planning policy per se, it, it is an undertaking being entered into by the council, um, not by the local planning authority, but by the council. Um, uh, and um, I, I've, asked, I've raised the question of what is the process for this to be, um, uh, um, whatever the expression is, taken through whatever process to ensure that it is clearly agreed as a council document, which might be portfolio holder decision or something, but there's nothing in Mike's report that suggests there is any process. So I've raised the question of, please can we know what the process is for this? Does it go to a committee? It is a portfolio holder decision. What is it? But, but there has to be some mechanism through which, if, the, if, if any of us disagree with some of the wordings, or, or would think there's danger in any of the wordings from the point of view of our residents and the council, that there is a process of scrutiny through which we can um, make those points. So, uh, has anybody got anything else to say about it? Yes, Chris? Well, just briefly, um, really to Mike. Um, are there are the authorities in within this you know this M3 group? Are they so very different that th this is that necessary? I mean, we don't go on forever, but just some background as to you know Surrey somehow easy to get whatever you want, or is it what, what's what's really driven it? The differences. I mean, I don't know the the exact processes that each authority employs, but I I would suggest from the from the point of view that it was proposed in the first instance, there must be some concerns that have been identified in that different authorities do have different processes, deal with things in different ways, different time scales, so on and so forth. So it's really just trying to capture the basic um, parameters, if you like, that, that all authorities would, would work within. Um, but I'm sure there would be some differences. Comment on that. The, the, um, it's, it's certain to my knowledge that uh, the, the standard of performance of authorities within the consortium is variable from a planning point of view. I mean, this is an Enterprise M3 thing, which is to do with the economy and business and jobs and all that sort of thing, which we are heavily engaged in, and indeed we're instrumental in starting. Um, uh, and I think what, it, what I see it as, because I have no background knowledge any more than you do, just seeing the report, I see it as a, a, an attempt by the Enterprise body on behalf of its members, and particularly the um, uh, Chambers of Commerce I mentioned, to get the planning authorities to raise their game. And I'm entirely in support of that. 
Um, I think we're better than most, um, but I think we can raise our game and need to do so. Um, but we need to raise our game, as I think Marilyn and Paul have pointed out, in, in support of residents and everybody else. Um, there's a question in there, of, and it says applicants and stakeholders. Well, who are the stakeholders? Because if I'm an objector, I think I'm a stakeholder. So it, is, it needs a bit of tidying up, I think, to make sure the words it uses actually express the meaning it intends and don't catch us in an area we wouldn't want to be in, trying to explain to our residents why Joe Bloggs, the, ba the baker, is an enterprise and therefore he's getting better treatment than me. I'm Joe Bloggs, not the baker, I'm his customer. And, you know, just to fence such things off. Everyone happy? Then Mike will carry those comments back. I don't think we're going to read them out or anything, because we're not. We're not an OSCOM. We're only being told about it. I'm, I've asked that question. I've asked it to be clarified what is the approval process for it. Because clearly it has to be signed off on behalf of the council by somebody, and, the, and that will need a process. So I've asked that, and if anybody ever tells me, I'll let you know. <laughs> and if they don't ever tell me, I'll chase them. <laughs> Everyone happy? Thank you all very much. Very expeditious meeting. Uh, and uh, we'll close the meeting at 24-7.